Hey, what's up? It's Rashad, Antonio OG, of course. Upon further review, we both saw Oppenheimer by one Christopher Nolan, one of our favorite filmmakers, probably the greatest filmmaker of his generation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, man, like he 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 made like three classics in a row. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> we be real nerdy with this, but mm -hmm. I would implore you to pay attention to who's directing, who's writing, not just the actors and all that stuff, but like who's behind the scenes, who's producing these movies. Yep. And I kind of give you a, like a good light into, you know, how the movie's going to be, what, mm -hmm. what they're trying to say about it. And it kind of leads us right into the discussion with um, Oppenheimer. Of course, this is basically... His, an historical movie. The majority of stuff really happened in real life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a whole lot of uh, fantastical elements. This story, okay. If you know Christopher Nolan, you already know he's never going to tell a linear story. Cor Ever. So, let's just say you want to be a weirdo. <laughs> and you want to be like, well, I want to go to Wikipedia and see what this movie's about first or whatever, and you just don't now understand it. Wikipedia has a note at the top of the plot where, you know, you go to plot, and the note reads, this film event takes place in a non-linear timeline, alternating between Oppenheimer's story from Cambridge to Los Alamos, his security hearing in 1954, and Strauss's confirmation hearing in 1959. For the purpose of this article, the story is just summarized in chronological order. So because what they're trying to tell you, this mm -hmm. movie is so difficult to yeah. do out of order because mm -hmm. it's not on like DVD or nothing yet. It hasn't been streamed to digital. They mm -hmm. said, hey, this is the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to need y'all to be happy about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So because the crazy part is it's really like that. He really would say, hey, you know what? Y'all think I'm going to sell this history historical movie. And, and A, B, C, D, E, he said, nah, mm -mm. it's going to be a couple different ways I'm going to tell the story in basically three different perspectives. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's like the crazy part. You know, here's my first initial takes on the movie Oppenheimer. Number one, it is three hours long. <laughs> and it feels... Uh, yo, and I did it, not realize it was three hours. <laughs> I didn't either. And it feels like three hours long. Number two, some people might see, hear the hype about the movie and really don't know the whole thing and they'll go, go see it. And then they'll go see it and be like, yeah, I didn't like it because, you know, some people, you know, not judging anybody or, you know, saying whatever. Some people just don't have the capacity to sit there and watch something like this. And like I said, it can be confusing because it is jumping all over the place as far as, you know what I'm saying, as flashbacks, flash, flashbacks, flash forward, what would be the present time of, you know what I'm saying, his life and stuff like that. And then number three, my other thing is, man, if you go watch this, for the love of God, please go watch this in IMAX. Definitely. Definitely. Because I I was in IMAX watching this like, 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 oh, oh, I felt like, <laughs> I felt like Murr from Home Alone 2 when he was getting electrocuted in wow. the face. Like, oh, it was just stimulatingly crazy, not just visually, but, but sound wise. Yeah. Auditory was, wise. Auditory. Too. It was yeah. just, it was crazy how auditory it was. Man. So, yeah. So even with that being said. Mm -hmm. The the number one thing, my number one takeaway from this movie is this is Christopher Nolan unhinged. Yes. Yo, F, it really yes. feel like because, OK, again, go on like behind the scenes with stuff. Right. Before Christopher Nolan's basically movie partners was Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers is notorious for editing stuff, taking stuff out, having director's notes and all that. So I felt since this is his first joint that's distributed by Universal, Universal said, hey, make whatever movie you want. And you he said, carte blanche. <laughs> he said, look, I have a runtime of exactly three hours. And this is what I really want to do. And it was like, man, we already paid you. So you might as well go ahead and do yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? And, it, and the, you know, the crazy part is, what's that? They're going to get their return on their investment. Yes. The movie made 80.5 mil. 
Yes. That's with like the counter programming of, of Barbie right. right next door. You know what I'm saying? Because both of them dropped basically the same time. So we can talk about that real quick. Bar, bar, you know, this weekend was Barbie, Barbie Hyman, as they like to call it or whatever. And of course, you know, people who are like, I'm not trying to see that. I'm going to go see Barbie or whatever. I expect Barbie to outsell this movie. If they, oops, going head to head. You know what I'm saying? Something failed by that. I expect Barbie to, you know what I'm saying, outsell this movie because Barbie is a is a is a a worldwide institution. Barbie made 150 what million, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, this weekend. I'm cool. But the fact that Oppenheimer still was able to pull 80 million is pretty daggone good. Especially this is like a historical, uh, you know what I'm saying, a historical movie and a and, and a movie that isn't, you know, super action packed like it's, Chris- it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Of all that. Yeah, you know I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So, so when I saw this coming, I was like, "Yo, this is gonna be real interesting to see, like, like, like this the crowds and the demographic that draws." Because I was in the theater, I was looking, and mm-hmm. when I mean mm-hmm. it was full of old white men and their wives <laughs> in there, I mean they were in that joint deep, and I was mm-hmm. like, "Well, this is kind of what I expect." You know what I'm yeah. saying? And of course, we seen. I saw all the social media stuff from the Barbie. I mean, they was they came out in droves, and when I left the theater. Mm-hmm. It was so many, like, 16 to, like, 25, 34-year-old women going to the movies. I said, I already know what they're going to see. If they, they were dressed up. If, the, the funniest thing I ever saw, I saw on, on social media was they said Barbie was uh, was the Black Panther for white women. I saw that, too. <laughs> and... <laughs> It was so true. I yeah. mean, it was really they 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 had their day in the sun, man, and everybody should. So like, yeah, all right, let's get back into yeah. to Oppenheimer mm-hmm. though. But yeah, so Chris Nolan said, "Hey, I want to make a three hour movie, and I want it to be and I want it to be basically set like this. I want to have um, Killian Murphy, basically Oppenheimer, who put in mm-hmm. who did an amazing job. I'm so glad that man is getting his flowers because yeah. you know he's been supporting character in all of Nolan's movies for the most part. Um, his perspective, so Oppenheimer's perspective. Mm-hmm. We also have like this random like black and white perspective, which we didn't realize until the end that was um, Strauss, um, Oppenheimer's. Um, you know the dude at the beginning we tried to like say, hey man, like you need to come join my college. That mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And Played then by Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who who also did a really good job. You know what I'm saying? Would, would not be surprised if he's nominated for best supporting actor. Right? Yeah, he, he did really good. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Cause like because in my mind, I'm like, okay, we we jumping around because there's no way this other story straight. Right. Because in my mind, I'm trying to figure out like, yo, who was gonna be the villain of the story? You know what yes. I'm saying? Yeah. Because seeing how we did not get any of the Japanese side of the story. Mm-hmm. There is no perspective of anybody else. And the story is truly told through the eyes of Oppenheimer mm-hmm. and the things that he cared about and what he loved and what he did. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And also told through the eyes of Strauss mm-hmm. of how he felt like, yo, yo, Strauss. Hater! When I mean Strauss was so mad and for nothing, for nothing. he just had a vendetta because he because he thought somebody he thought somebody said something about him. Yeah. So this was so this is what Strauss's problem right here. Number one, he felt embarrassed because there was some type of commission. Or, and um, he wanted to do something. I can't recall. Yeah, he wanted he wanted to kind of press the issue of the hydrogen bomb, right? Of the hydrogen bomb or whatever. And Oppenheimer basically like played him, you know, not necessarily played him. Just like yo, this is ridiculous. It kind of made him look ridiculous. He had all these science people laugh at him. Ne- also, Strauss was not a science person no, as well. He at wasn't all. a sci- at all a science person. So that happened. And then what also happened is he's trying to get Oppenheimer to come and be a professor at his college that he's in charge of and stuff like that. And that's the same college that Albert Einstein also is a professor at this college as well. So what happens? So, you know, he sees Albert Einstein at a pond and he's like, oh, yeah, he comes out here all the time and feed the ducks and blah, 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 this and that. 
And blah, blah, blah. he was like, and, and he thought he was kind of like Big Willian. No, he, he, was, he was trying to flex on him. Yo. Yeah, like, like yo, hey, like, you want you want to meet him? And he was just like, so Oppenheimer didn't even flex back. He just thought, he was like, oh, yeah, we like basically came back. I was like, yeah, we, 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 we know each other for years, man. Like, that's 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 my guy. Mm-hmm. And in the movie, in the beginning of the movie, you see that um, Oppenheimer walks out towards Einstein at this pond. Strauss kind of leans back, you know, just to see the view of like basically these two scientific geniuses like having a conversation, but he's not within earshot of the conversation. You see yeah. the conversation going on, and then next thing you know, you see Einstein walking away, and and Strauss is like, "Hello, Einstein, Albert, how are you doing?" Blah blah blah. This is that, and Einstein like basically like ignores him, ignores him completely. Like yeah, he just blows him off, blows yeah. him off, and because of that, he felt that. They were talking about me. They were talking <laughs> negative about me. And because of that, compiled with later on after the atomic bomb success, and you know what I'm saying, and Strauss wanted to, you know, go to the next level to work on the hydrogen bomb. Because of that, he had a vendetta, a V for vendetta, you know what I'm uh-huh. saying, thing for Oppenheimer. And we find out at the end of the movie that. That you know, we 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 start the movie kind of like where we we end the movie where we started off. They Definitely. actually show the conversation between Einstein and Oppenheimer, and also like during Strauss's point of view, the guy that's like his assistant. You know, when he was trying to get commissioned to be on the um like the presidential committee or whatever, he was like, "Yo, you going through all this? Do you even know what the conversation's about? How do you know they were talking about you? They the only ones that had the conversation. Nobody was saying. He just looked at him like, huh? And then it goes and shows back that conversation. And you actually hear. They ain't say jack-ish about Strauss. They were talking about the ramifications of creating the atomic bomb. Yeah. And, and basically, that's what this movie was about for me. Dealing with, you know, Oppenheimer having, in the beginning, creating this theory of, yeah, this can't be done but we really don't need to do it. And then the U S goes and drops the bomb, not once, but twice, (laughs) not once, but twice. And he basically is like, Oh my God, I created this weapon of mass destruction. And he feels, and he's dealing with like the PTSD, even though he didn't drop it, he created it. The PTSD of millions of people dying, you know what I'm saying? Who died because of this. And then it's like, how much further are we going to go with this? Because now another country is going to try to make a bomb. And then America's at the same time talking about something. Atom bomb was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's work on a hydrogen bomb. <laughs> like, yo, like, what's going on here? It's crazy. And you know what the crazy part is? Why, like, the even that conversation that Albert and him were having was like, look, yo, do you understand that when we, when we put this bomb out there, we could actually start a chain reaction and within the atmosphere that literally burns the entire world. Yeah. 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 Tony, yeah. I was like, yeah. Yeah. So, Tony, the, the ridiculous <laughs> nature of somebody who was wanting to do the thing as an, I mean, come on, you, you gotta be yeah. a little bit crazy to be a scientist. Yeah. And they say, you know what, Psh, let's do it. Right. And he agreed to, like the risk of uh, Tony literally yeah. burning the entire world because yeah. the atmosphere was so charged mm-hmm. that we just burn everything. And they say, you know yeah. what? Yeah, let's try it out. And these yeah. fools was outside just chilling with glasses on and, and like, you know, like metal worker masks, you know, pieces of metal, like, 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 like you, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you know, yeah. um, I'm welding steel. I'm like, I'm like, Lawn chairs. Yes. <laughs> Chilling. My man, what my man put on like some, from your, he put some on, UV he, cream. He, he put like on sunburn. petroleum jelly on his face. <laughs> like face. that was going to protect him. Right. You know what I'm and, saying? I, and I love the thing. He was like, he says, you want some of this? He says, this is for the UV light. And he says, yeah, but what's going to protect you from the bomb? That's what he said. And he, the guy sat there and looked at him and was like, oh, good point, or whatever. Because every because yeah. because most, because even him, when they was doing the test, every time he would still look at the bomb. Every mm-hmm. time he would look at, he would look up and look at it. So this mm-hmm. fool was knowingly risking his eyes and life on purpose. Mm-hmm. Stupid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, and it's just crazy because you know it's like that. Like you said, going back, that was a big concern. Like you said, it was like yo, with the um, at, you know, with the chain reaction and we burning the atmosphere. 
And like there was like, uh, is this gonna happen? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. We don't like, know. We don't know. And so then they was like, well, let's go to probably the smartest person in the world that's not working on this and ask them. But they went to Albert Einstein. They didn't tell Albert Einstein what it was because he wasn't a part of you know saying mm -hmm. the Manhattan Project. They just gave him an equation. And they said, hey, he was like, hey, guys, what's going on? He said, I heard you guys working on something, you know, good, whatever, like that. And he was like, they had a piece of paper. And it was like, hey, Albert, I want you to look at this and tell us what you think. And I was like, okay, okay, oh, okay. Oh. It's like, y'all doing looked, this? And then he looks up at them and he looks back. And mind you, nothing on the paper is written like, we are making an atomic bomb. Nah, it's just it was an just equation, a formula. A formula. And he looked at it and he looked at them and was like, and he knew automatically, like, I know in his mind, he was like, y'all mofos really about to make an atomic bomb out here. He looked, and it was like, so what do you think? He was like, uh, give me some time to go over this. <laughs> give me some time to go over this. I'll let you guys know or whatever. So, you know, apparently his notes that he came back was like, hey, if y'all do this, whatever precautions, it's a near zero percent chance that this is going to happen. And that's the, that's the scene you see in, you've seen in trailers in the movie where, you know, Matt Damon, who was the, um, Who's the a military official? Who's like yeah, he's an army whole, general, yeah. army general over the whole project, and like they're you know it's the day of, and he was like, hey, blah blah blah. He was like, so are you trying to tell? And he was like, what what do you mean? Because they started taking bets. The scientists started taking odds. Like, all right, what you think is gonna happen? Oh, it's gonna blow. It's gonna do this. Oh, it's gonna be a, a ten gilaton. Then he said. He says, what about bets on atmosphere? He says, chain reacts for the atmosphere and fire. <laughs> and then people was like, yeah, give me some. Here's the thing. They're taking bets on this. And these people could die from this. They are just taking yeah, they bets. Yeah, they're not coming back if that actually happens. They're not coming back. And you got that. David was like, hey, so what do you mean about this? He was like, it was just a, you know, a slight theory that this possibly could, you know, chain reaction. You know, if you know, we fire it off and the chain reaction doesn't stop. And it was like, what? what he said, so you're trying to tell me that we could fire this off and it'd be the end of the world. He was like, it's near zero percent. Near zero percent. He says, "How about can we make that zero percent?" Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> you know, good. whatever. Yeah, man. So. Yo, so there's so there's a lot of stuff like that. So, all right, let's uh -huh. let's, let's talk about Oppenheimer himself. So, is I'm I'm kind of glad that Oppenheimer was viewed essentially like according to 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 lore, like how he really was as a person, because mm -hmm. we could have easily made this into him being like some like weird dude like on the spectrum mm -hmm. and you know what i'm saying just you know mm -hmm. being you not know, just being quirky for like for no reason but they made mm -hmm. this dude say hey but we need y'all to know that this man was a really smart man but he was really a man for real yeah. because what i mean i did not think old oppie was gonna be out here panty rating the entire time <laughs> You know what? There was a song created a couple of years ago for Oppenheimer, and we didn't even know it. I love bad bitches, and that's the effing problem. <laughs> I love bad bitches, that's my effing problem. That is Oppenheimer's problem. He liked bad women. He liked chicks. He won't, he won't the drizzles. That's what he Yo. is. That is what Yo. he is after he's talking Jack. About, he's talking about find a, finding the um, the formula for the bomb. That man yeah. found the equation for the vagina. Zyna, he right? is <laughs> always there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. First, let's, let's, let's play this. He's married. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Married. Figure that out. Mm -hmm. Then he's messing around with his boy's wife. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then messing around with his other boy's wife. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, because mm -hmm. he 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 was just making flirty eyes with everybody, just yeah. in in his little circle. Mm -hmm. Like, not only is he smart, but he messy. Like, Oppenheimer right. was super messy. He knew all yeah. this stuff at the house, basically. And, and his and, wife was, and his wife and, knew. That's how bold it was. He told his wife, "Hey, this is what's happening right here. It's not you." It's me, and I found somebody who I think understands me better than you. So, you know, hey, it is what it is. She's going to actually divorce her husband. So, and, then, and the wife was like, you got her pregnant, didn't you? He was like, eh, yeah. So, you know, she's going to divorce her husband. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and get married, you know, in time before she starts the show. You know, like, he had all this planned out in his head and that and like it, i love that they showed that he was a flawed human 
You know, oh, so, yeah. and, he, and he was just a man, and he was a man. And him being flawed also went into his um his scientific ways because you see early on he is horrible at practice at practical science Yo. and a, and applying science. Yo. He was horrible, terrible. And, and you, you what did he end up going? So he was like, in in London or one of those one of those um scientific programs or something in Tony. London. It was Tony, in the lab destroying Tony. stuff. <laughs> his his professor was digging at him every day to the yeah. point where he put he poured, cyanide in he an got, apple to kill that poison, man. He tried to poison that man. I said, he said, yo, that man put so much pressure on me. I don't like you as a person anymore. Yeah, you should die. That, you know you what should saying? die. Right. Yeah. He really like, yo, he went there. Cyanide. And he said, you know what? Yes, I hit him with the dag on. Um, what 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 fairy tale is that? <laughs> the apple, Snow White. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> trying to Snow White that man, yo. Like, it looks delicious, my pretty. Go ahead. Yo, t- I, I was like, something's yeah. wrong with this man. Yeah, he tried, and, and the only reason he didn't do it because the other professor that he loved, you know, what I'm saying, you know, he wanted, you know, he so he saw his um his lecture and all that came back, yeah, and he said, oh my god, I forgot about the apple. So he's yeah. running the class. Mm-hmm. And the man almost and, and the and the world renowned yeah. speaker yeah. lecture that came out almost ate the apple. Yeah, and I don't know if all that, that I don't like. Well, I don't know if all that part is true. But if but it like, is, that's some still, wild shit. Yeah, yo. And, and the fact that he liked that lecture because that lecture was like, "Hey, man, I wasn't good at practical science too, or whatever." He says he's like Oppenheimer. Here's the thing: Oppenheimer was a genius in theory, having theories, creating formulas. He still he won't even that great in math. He'll tell you that too. He he had the theories and he had what he felt formulas he could do, but he wasn't he couldn't apply it. That's why when, yeah yeah. That's why when he took great that point. job. He took that first job at Berkeley, at um, UC Berkeley. He he wanted his room next to that other scientist who was like already won a Nobel Peace Prize and applying certain type of scientific, yeah. you know, what I'm saying scientific thing. You know, it's another thing that's kind of like glossed over. In <laughs> What's this. that? <laughs> this man discovered black holes. Low key. This man, like, like, and if and people are like, what are you talking about? If you get if you want to go back and watch it for another three hours, but in the, the, <laughs> that's it. Like he's teaching his class, you know, he's teaching his class quantum what quantum physics because they didn't have that over in the U.S. at the time. And he started the program over at Berkeley, and there was a, a kid that was a doctor who was taking the class, and he basically was explaining, yeah, there's something out there in space that's like drawing matter that draws all matter when it comes close to it, like no light or whatever can escape. He says, but we don't. We just can't see it. We don't know what it was. Yeah. He, if, and like I said, if this is true as well, he came up with the theory and came out with a paper and they said, yo, you came up and they had, and they approved this paper dissertation of, okay, there's this things out there called black holes in space that's sucking up light and matter or whatever. But guess what? The day he thought that, you know, they was going to put an article in the paper and stuff about him. Oh, the Nazis invade Poland. World War II, he was like, yeah, man, you're taking the back seat on this right it's, here. It's a, yeah, yo, this ain't, it, don't nobody care about this. <laughs> nobody care about this. They care about this right here. So, yeah, so you you see, you see also, too, throughout the movie where, and it goes back and forth. In the beginning, it goes back and forth a whole lot from when he was in college to, you know, I guess their present time to pass that where you see like he's like and you see like the, the explosions and and he's just thinking about you know the effects of like an atomic bomb and stuff like that and in retrospect you don't really know if he's thinking about this after the facts or during the time you know what i'm saying because nolan does a great job of like interweaving the actual events of the bomb into the into the storyline yeah and to, to make it a visual thing, almost like a, um, like he's having a vision of the future. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's it's really it's really funny just how they how they go back and forth because we have him being seen in the like like this like the basically like, like a subcommittee mm-hmm. hearing, mm-hmm. and then we see him talking at this um at this other hearing she talked about where he um made Strauss look stupid. 
Mm-hmm. And then you have the um, the current, what will be like the present day in that movie mm-hmm. when he's like, you know, making them like making the whole thing. Cause that's mm-hmm. basically, again, that's, that's like the color, like the color part of the movie. Uh-huh. And then of course there's all like just the, the Strauss, all, point, of the, view the Strauss point of view, which is in clearly in black and white. Yeah. And now that I saw the movie and realized that that whole black and white part is the part of the villain. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, I know because like Nolan was saying, basically, the the part that's in um in in color is like the more like objective part. Like that's the part that's like you know that's really happened. And then the black and white is is more subjective. So mm-hmm. the way I interpret it is. Strauss's thing is very subjective because that's how he felt about everything that was going on. And yeah. instead of actually, you know what I'm saying, verifying and dealing with it, that's just how he felt that that everything went. Yeah. Um, let's talk about him having his his hearing. And this, and you know, the whole time people we're trying to figure out, damn, who has this vendetta against this man to where I want to make something perfectly clear. I thought this, and this really did happen. And I thought this was like showing, you know, the trash side of the United States. This man created an atomic bomb. He, you know, he created, he helped create atomic bomb along with other scientists and everything like that. Right. And because one person had a problem and behind the scenes caused all this stuff and commotion and got people to do this and that, he loses his security clearance. He loses his, and mind you, once again, Strauss is not a scientist. You have all these other people that are scientists who has his back, except for the one person, Hill, who wanted to further the, you know what I'm saying, the, the hydrogen bomb. Hydrogen yeah. bomb thing. And, and he was like, hey, man, like, hey, at what point? He, you know, if, if he, Oppenheimer was like, to the point where he was like, hey, at what point does this stop? Like, we have to, at some point, like, yeah. you know, take a step back and be like, yo, we're going to end up doing something that's going to be catastrophic. And one scene that shows the empathy that he has for creating the bomb and realizing like, God dang, yo, I've really started something was when, because of this two things, Germany has already surrendered in world war two. Germany already wait. They, they waved the white flag. Hitler is dead or whatever. They were creating the atomic bomb to drop on Germany. That was their whole thing. They drop drop on Germany. That was their whole thing. Yeah, we gotta stop the Nazis. Yeah, we gotta stop the Nazis. They already quit. The government was like, "Keep doing what you're doing," or whatever. And they basically was like, "Look, we still at war with the Japanese, and they ain't quitting. And they and no matter what we do." And then so Oppenheimer agreed to do it because he's like, "Yo, if we." Build this to let them know, hey, y'all keep effing with us. We gonna do this type thing or whatever. You know, maybe they'll stop. The U.S. is like, yeah, 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 they'll stop. Just, just build us two, two bombs. One that's real big, quick bomb, and one that's kind of, you know, smaller than that. And you, and so they dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the thing is. He asked, hey, yo, let me know when y'all do it or when y'all are going to do it. They never called that man and told him. No, he heard it on the radio like everybody else. On the radio like everybody else. He goes to see the president, Harry Truman. And you see, like, he's still dealing with the thought of God, all these people that died from this or whatever. And he sees the Time Magazine article. So he's already going through this in his mind. And he sees the Time Magazine article that says, (laughs) the father of the atomic bomb. And he looks at it and is like, ugh. And then Harry S. Truman, once again, don't know if this is true or not, but if so, trash. That's all I got to yo. say, man. Yo, my Rashad. Yo, so, he, so yeah, go, go ahead, ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. So they're talking, and again, no one does this. I'm, I'm gonna intercut. Mm-hmm. And in an intercut to a prior meeting of him talking to you know what i'm saying like i guess like joints heads of state and whatever uh-huh. and he's they said hey well we got a list of 12 cities we can we can <laughs> drop these bombs on he said i already cho- i already chopped it down to 11 11 <laughs> um because um yeah kyoto that's a real like historical cultural um, cultural uh, yeah. place for the japanese people and me and yeah. my wife went on vacation there it's a lovely yeah, place yeah yeah <laughs> i was like yo yeah and at that point it solidified to me that yeah White people be doing anything. Yeah. And what was it, it he said too? He was like, uh, he was like, look, man, he he actually came up with the idea of like accords to control 
atomic bomb thing. He was telling Harry S. Truman, this Harry S. Truman was like, mm, okay. Because Truman was so excited to meet this man. Like, you created a bomb. You created a weapon that I use to drop on these, these fools and stuff like that. And Truman, and then he was like, yeah, you know, and he just starts talking about like, you know, I, I, I can't sleep at night, you know. Like, we need, like, like we need regulations, you know what regulations I'm saying? Regulations stuff. Then Truman looked at him and said, let me tell you something. Nobody cared that you made that. They gonna say that I dropped it. I'm perfectly all right with it. He was like, I'm perfectly all right with that and everything. And then he was like, so you gonna stay on for the hydrogen bomb team? He was like, no, nah, I'm good, bro. And then he was like, so what do you think we should do with all that land? He was like, let's give it back to the Indians. Like, because because that's a whole other thing right there that you find out about that. You know, we, we might talk oh. about that on another episode or whatever. But he was just like, hey, let's give it back to him. Do you see the look Harry Truman gave him? Like, Yeah, no, no, nah, that's not gonna happen. It's Who else so was in the room with him? Was, was was that the VP that was in the room with him? I I don't know. I think it might have been the Secretary of Defense or something. It was somebody Either way, else. man. Like and his are... facial his facial expressions <laughs> was hilarious. He was yeah. like, "Give it to the Indians. Give it to the Indians. You lost your mind." Yo, and so, which and is then even, when he was, which is even... about when he was. I'm sorry, my bad. Go ahead. No, 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 it was even crazier because like, remember he said he. White people don't be caring, yo. Like at all, at all. They, they, Oppenheimer said, "Hey, there's a place where it's pretty remote. I love it. I, I, I've, I've been there. Me and my brother, you know, what I'm saying we know the land. We can, yeah, we can a, get it squared ranch, away. You know? They, yeah, yeah. It's just a place where you know we, we, you know, we got a place there. You know what I'm saying? Like my, fa- yeah. my family does. Yeah. So this goes to tell you just how well off they already was. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And secondly, they had to clear all the native people off." They said, "Hey, they, they do something. They do like some like they, they do like some ritualistic stuff here, but like other than that, nah, they good. Just yeah. totally brushed them off. Yeah, they said they it's, went through and bulldozed like Native American yo. houses and everything, and leveled that and lost and lo- what Los Almas. They labeled, yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. They Los leveled Alamos, out and yeah. got and got all of those Native Americans out to create to create that. But this is also what I want to say. After the meeting, he's like, "All right, yeah, going out of here." Harry S. Truman was like. Yo, get this pansy ass out of here. He don't ever come back. He basically called Oppenheimer a bitch. It's <laughs> basically it said, y'all, you don't need to come back no more. <laughs> but when I get that pansy out of here, y'all, this and that. He was, you know what it was like? How they say never meet your heroes. That's what no. happened to Harry S. Truman. He met the guy that he thought was his hero because he created this damn bomb, and he didn't live up to being like this doctor war that he yeah, thought that he yeah, was going to yeah, be, man. Yeah, yeah, he. he he thought he was going to be like, like warmongering yeah. and all like, you know, like, yeah, USA, yeah. USA, America. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what he, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what he really thought, <laughs> yo. And it's, it's just crazy, man. Like I, I was and okay. So I got to about the end scene. The end scene to me is it ends so impactfully because yes. when, um, Einstein, they show a flashback, basically the actual scene of him and, um, you know, when Robert Downey Jr.'s character, Strauss got pissy. He uh-huh. said, hey, he said, look, he said, look, man, when this, he said, well, he said they're going to basically, they're going to go against you. Mm-hmm. And they even kick you out, basically. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to come around and try to, you know, make up for what they did to you. And, exactly and, what they did. and and the thing that he said was um Einstein said that was so real. He said, and when they do this and they try to um celebrate you, it's not gonna be for you, it's gonna be for them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Yeah, oh yeah. like for me, like that was like a like almost some life lesson type stuff. I was yeah. like, yo, that's that was a very I, I know it's on the surface, it sounds real mm-hmm. obvious and goofy, but that was, to me, like that was like the most profound statement. Of the whole thing, of the whole movie to me, because that's exactly what happened. And shout out to Oppenheimer's wife. That chick can hold a grudge. Like, no yo. Way. She had to been a Scorpio, because I'm a Scorpio and I hold grudge. Yo, that chick yo. was on another level of grudge. Nah, she know. won't shake nobody like, hand. She what? won't shake none of them folk hand years later when they finally gave him some type of award. The one guy that really, like, tried to groom, he stuck his hand out. Oppenheimer was just like, because she kept saying, fight back, please, fight. Yeah, yeah, Fight yeah, back. Yeah. And he was just like, yeah, and he was self-deprecating. 
he felt he deserved that because what he created very and he, true and all the lives that, that that died and maybe future lives that's going to die because of the atomic bomb so he felt he deserved that and she told him that to his face and he had that look like oh then thank you you know what I'm saying kind of noticed that yeah and the last scene of the movie as well how, yeah it was, it was basically yeah basically was what he what he saw was kind of like the um nuclear war yeah, it, it 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 was it was cool because it was one of those things where this is a thing that is usually spoken, mm-hmm. like the like you know the, 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 we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing these things because yada yada yada. And it was like now nah, let's just show you mm-hmm. the world burning because we can't figure out how to behave and get along with one another, mm-hmm. and it just ends like that. And I sat there like, yeah. Oh boy, this is a cautionary tale. (laughs) Just just think about that. People like, oh, everybody just starts launching their daggone nuclear weapons, like not at the same time, but like back to back to back. And oh, look what happens. Bye bye, Earth. You know, crazy man. Like it's it's so much that we ain't talking about, but like, man, it's it's this this movie right here. Yeah. Is like I said at the beginning, it's full Chris Nolan, man. And yeah, whew, yeah, heavy, heavy movie. Great job. This is gonna win a lot of the awards, yeah, definitely. automatically. And oh, by the way, for people that didn't know, the atomic bomb that they, that he did let off, like the test, that was an actual atomic bomb explosion, no CGI, it's practical effects, practical effects, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um. Amen to another great Christopher Nolan um, director movie. Uh, see you guys on Wednesday. We're gonna have um, Secret Invasion finale. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, not sure if you saw your, your rewatch of Rebels. We need to yes. get on that. Oh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm almost done with the first. I got like three more episodes of the first season. Good. So so we'll um, probably drop that like Thursday or so, and um, and we'll then resume back on Wednesdays for the rewatch for um, for Rebels. All right, y'all. Till next time.